see everybody here. It's, it's really your folks. You know, it's just your folks. And, and I love it, and I was thinking about the song uh, I wanted to sing this morning. I've, I've changed probably three or four times since I've got it here in church, but uh, I was thinking about this song because of our graduates, and uh, if, if they'll, they should always remember, no, worth, no matter where they go, what they do, that God's always got that unseen hand that's stretched out for you. And uh, I think that's what I'm going to say about this song.
To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth, and teach me, for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are come of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. He will spend his days in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord. To you, O Lord, I lift my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Thank you so much. Each week we do tithes and offerings, give you the opportunity to give uh, to the Lord an offering. And there is a plate in the front and in the back. And there's also the Eloise offering in the back. And if you don't know what that is, that is a dollar offering. We're asking you, whatever you were going to give, to give one more dollar. And that dollar would get put in that, uh, in that can, that watering can, because we are planting seeds and watering them in Murray County. We are reaching out to the folks that are downtrodden, the folks that are hurting, the folks that are poor, the folks that are on the street. In so many different ways, we take that money each week and we send it to a ministry in Murray County. And so it has been a blessing. We've gotten a stack of thank you cards already from ministry saying thank you for thinking of us and blessing us in this way. And you may think that $50 won't help here or $50 won't help there. Trust me, it does. And uh, they are thankful to get every dime uh, that people are willing to give because their ministries are, are struggling at this point with the economy that we're in. <clears throat> um, let's do praises and prayers at this time. Do you have people that you want to lift to the Lord that aren't already on our prayer list? I know Myrtle has one. What was his name, Myrtle? Troy Mills. Troy Mills. He's on Nick, uh, Nick's, Nick Bolton's tribal baseball team, and his name's Troy Mills. He's in Vanderbilt, did you say? Okay, and he's waiting on a liver transplant, and uh, and uh, actually has had some, some severe issues there. So please pray for him, 15 years old. Yes, Larry. Uh, my brother-in-law went through his surgery, brain surgery, successful. Uh, they're waiting now for some biopsy. He went through a little bit of therapy at the hospital, went home two days, he's back in the hospital. Mm -hmm. He caught COVID. <laughs> so, Gary Gilmore, so remember me. He's, uh, he's got COVID. He is going through some trials pretty right. Um, Larry was telling me that they had, the incision was from like here to here on his head and then all the way in the front, in front to back uh, to take care of a spot, right, that they had said that, that they saw. Um, that was the surgery that he had. Now he has COVID, so pray for him. Anyone else? Yes, Thank Amber. Thank you, Stad. I was taken to the hospital this morning via ambulance. Um, don't really know anything. They're still waiting for him to be checked in. Okay. I got a phrase. Um, you know, I work on the UK, uh, you know, outreach route. It's going a lot better. It's Good. picking up, and that's just something I want to say thanks to God for because it was scary. Okay. It's a good good price. James Upshaw graduated yesterday uh, from Columbia State. We'll talk more about that later. But congratulations, that's awesome. It's wonderful. Anybody else? 
Lots of safe travels for my family that all came in for Sela's shows. Thank you that there was like 27 people there for the shows from the church um, and that um, uh, two of those, sh those shows were sold out. So thank you so much, or two of the three. And uh, thank you for coming out and being a part of that for Sela. She enjoyed it. Yes, Marcy. Based on the screw tape letters by C.S. Lewis. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I just wonder if Mark and Marcy watched that because of the story I told on Wednesday night. <laughs> My friend George uh, went to a service. Uh, I'm not going to go there. He made it, a girl evidently had a demon within her, and George had never experienced that. And, and it was uh, he basically bolted for the door almost because uh, he was so thrown by that, uh, that episode. Anybody else? <clears throat> Yes, Sila. I got to work as manager yesterday at my work. Okay. Sila was manager yesterday for her uh, princess group that she, they do birthday parties and stuff. She's getting promoted. She also did a fantastic job in the play. We probably already talked about that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yes, thank you. No, that's awesome. Um, and, and thank you for your prayers because you all know that Sila's best friend gave her a ticket to see Taylor Swift on Friday night. And I know y'all were praying for Sila because I was sending her down there with just the two of them and, uh, and the 70,000 people. and. And then they had to run all those news things this week about how many people were going to be in downtown Nashville over the weekend. And so um, she got home safely. And so thank you for your prayers for that. That's great. Any others? Jody, how's your mom doing? She's probably going to go home Wednesday. Good, good. It's Elaine uh, Neal and Ashley Neal. Yeah. So let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much uh, that we are the body of Christ and that we, you tell us to pray without ceasing, to pray continually. And we do that, Lord. We lift our voices to you lots of places, in our cars, on our back porch, uh, at the grocery store, um, you know, on our walk. Um, wherever, wherever we are, Lord, we're in church, we're lifting our voices to you in prayer. And we ask, Lord, that you would hear our prayers. Um, you know, we are, you call us a royal priesthood and you say that our prayers matter, especially when we come together to pray. And so we lift up these folks, these situations to you and we ask for healing, um, especially for Troy Mills, Lord, 15 years old to be having a liver transplant is a terrible thing. And so I do pray that you would heal him completely, Lord. Um, we have friends and family that are in hospitals. We have friends and family that are, um, you know, uh, dealing with getting ready to have surgeries like Bobby Johnson tomorrow. And so we ask your, your healing hand on them and that you give them the best doctors and nurses and medicines and that you would take care of every detail, that your Holy Spirit would heal them from the inside out and that you, your word would change them, Lord. Um, I, I claim all the promises you tell us in John 14, 14, to just pray and believe, to pray it in Jesus' name. And uh, that's what we're, we're doing here, Lord. Forgive us for our unbelief. And uh, we ask that you would meet every financial need, that you heal every marriage that needs healing, that you would heal our government, give us godly Christian leaders. I pray, Lord, that you would bless our church and bless our graduates today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, at this time, uh, the kids can come forward for the kids' message, but I am going to need some help. So, Connor, come help me if you would. The kids can come forward and sit right here in the normal spot, and the kids that are here.
you know, especially if you haven't ever had kids and you want to, if you're thinking about having children, if you have kids, if you have middle schoolers, high schoolers, whatever, we have to learn this premise that Jesus talks about, and that is how does, do things just happen? How do kids grow up to be great kids? Is it just we just kind of let them go, and let them grow up, and then they just suddenly turn into these great people? No, and, and in fact, we, it takes a lot of work, and so for us, sometimes we do take, you know, this is a beautiful bowl, and we just assume that something is going to grow in it, because that's what it's made for, right? We just assume that a beautiful plant is going to come up out of that, and yet, does that ever happen? Nope. Will this bowl with no dirt in it ever produce anything? No. Nope. And see, that's such a simple concept, and yet we miss it every single day is that we end up having to take something, we take one of these pots and we put dirt in it, right? And it really does depend on what kind of dirt we put in it. If we go down, if Larry and I get in our cars and we drive down to the Mississippi River, we go to Memphis and eat some barbecue and we're, we're down there and we're along the banks of the river and Larry reaches down his hand and takes a scoop of the dirt, what does it look like? dark and it's brown and it's so rich with nutrients because it's right there on the delta it's right there on on this beautiful floodplain and that that i mean stuff will grow in it like nobody's business but if we go like in our backyard out here and we dig up some of this wonderful red clay and we fill this beautiful pot with red clay how much stuff's going to grow in it not much not much right so we have to have the right kind of soil and we put that in there and then will something just automatically grow if I have a, just a pot of dirt sitting on my porch, nothing's going to grow in it. Grass. Now, yeah, like weed or something might blow into it and grow in it, right? That might happen. But actually what we want is we, we're going to take this dirt and we're going to plant a seed in it. And God plants that seed within us and it kind of lays there until what? What do we do? Because Bob and Myrtle, they'll go out on their farm and they'll till it up. Jimmy Upshaw does the same thing. Some of the others of you have gardens. You go out and you till it up. They'll get you some nice soil like in this pot. And then you take a seed and you plant it in there. And are you done till the fall? No. You understand? It'll still be this. I, if I plant it in there, I'm going to tell you right now, it might come up. There might be this beautiful little shoot come up. But then what happens? If I don't water this tender little shoot, what happens? If I don't take some of this beautiful clear water and pour it in there, and it dies. And then eventually, if, uh, if I don't put some fertilizer on it, it might wilt because it doesn't have enough vitamins and minerals. And then it also, there will be weeds that come up. And so I might have to pull those away, right? I might have to because the weeds suck up the nutrients in the water away from the plant. So I have to do some work on it. I have to keep the animals away. I have to keep the birds away, the insects away. Those are all things that I have to do so that I can get a plant. And so if we walked out and we went, man, look what I planted in that pot and I got this. We might be happy, right? We, well, some of y'all would go, no, that's our vision. No, but you understand what I mean is that we would, if, we, if this was the plant that we planted and it came up and it looked like that, we'd be like, yes. But what would Jesus think of it? Jesus would go, that's a lot of good looking leaves. It's pretty, it's green, right? It's good looking leaves. But what is he looking for in us? What's God looking for us when he plants that seed within us? He's looking for something beautiful. He's looking for something that is fruit or flowering, right? And so for us, that takes certain things like the bees, right? That we talked about last week. The bees come in and they pollinate. They land here and they pick up some nectar, right? They pick up nectar and pollen on their feet, right? And they get it and they go over here and they... They pollinate. They move stuff around between plants and between vegetables and between flowers. And we do that. That's the role of the church. Is the church goes out and they spread Jesus' word everywhere. And because of the things that they do that are written in the Bible, they are watering. They are pruning. They are weeding. They are fertilizing. They're doing all these things to make sure that you get that we all grow up to be these beautiful plants. But like I said... God's not just looking for a bunch of leaves. He's looking for fruit. He's looking for something that is amazing, something that's beautiful, something that's incredible. And so sometimes when we put all those things together, we get something like this. And you step back and you go, that's real. That's something that's grown. That somebody with skill did everything. They took a pot like this and they planted in there and they did everything to it. And this is the final. Result. This is something so beautiful. 
And we can see when somebody is putting all those things into place, we can see what that does in their lives. Let me give you another example. So the same thing is true. We can do the exact same thing by saying, okay, I want to do good in school. Right, Nora? You're going to go to kindergarten here before long, and you say, I want to do good in school. Well, you know what you have to do? You don't just automatically get smart. It doesn't just kind of all, you can't lay down with your head on a textbook at night and it just kind of all that information get in there, right? We have to go to school and to be there, physically in there, right? And we have to sit in our chair and listen to what a teacher, the expert who has all the information tells us, right? We have to ask questions, you know what I'm saying? The information that we get, we take home and we practice, right? Whether it's math or science or any of those things. Then we come back and we take tests and that information is in our heads. We've learned it, right? It's come into our heads and it produces this on tests and quizzes, right? Is that as we grow, as we do those things, we find success, we get better in school. Then we get out of school, maybe go to college or get a job and we know how to do things because we put each of those things into place. If we leave one out, what happens? We struggle, right? We have, we have real struggles. So I encourage you because in the Bible, over and over, God says, hey, why don't you pray in your life? Why don't you build relationships with other Christians? Why don't you worship me? Why don't you learn the Bible? Why don't you serve in the community? Why don't you tell people about Jesus? And when we do those things, the final result is something like this, as opposed to something that looks like that. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the world and thank you for the place that you've put us because it's absolutely gorgeous. There's so much stuff in this world that is just amazing and such a blessing to us. And uh, we walk right past it because we're busy with all the little things that we've got going on. And we forget to give you the praise. We forget to say thank you for letting us wake up this morning. Thank you for the breakfast. Thank you for my bed. Thank you for you know riding in a car to get here and that we have a church to come to and people who love us and air conditioning and heat and bathrooms that are inside and clean water. Just all these wonderful things, Lord. And help us to be appreciative of those things. And then, Lord, I pray that we would be in our lives diligent about putting these things, these different you know, uh, principles into place in our lives so that we can find success and beauty and fruitfulness for you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I want you to hang out. Connor, come help me again if you would. I want you to hang out for just a second because we want to honor our graduates. And so I want you guys to be in here for that part. That's it, right? So I want to have James Upshaw and Sela Caldwell come up. Side, and I'll let you both stand there side by side. Since it's ladies first, James. Uh, uh, you helped purchase Bibles. We do this every year for um, our students, whether we called it a baccalaureate service or not. Um, we believe that we want to give them a gift, and what better gift could we give them than God's Word? And so this is the Women's Study Bible that we got for Selah, and uh, it's a beautiful blue Bible, blue leather Bible. And uh, I want to say congratulations to you on graduating high school, even though um, she doesn't graduate physically until the 26th. You shake your hand at 7 o'clock. Yeah, that's my daughter, so you know. And then we got uh, James, the Charles Stanley Life Principles Bible and uh, in leather. And so congratulations to you, sir. It's a great achievement. And... Uh, I'm just going to tell you all right now, because this is what I would, what God has kind of put on my heart, is that it takes a lot of work to graduate elementary school. It takes a lot of work to graduate middle school. It takes a lot of work to graduate high school. And all the way through that, Satan is constantly trying to go, get off track here, get off track here, get off track here, get off track here, get off track here. And so when somebody graduates, we celebrate it because it's amazing. Uh, that they got to that point in their lives and that they're ready for the next step, whether that's a job or whether that's going to college or whatever it might be. And so the same is true for like college for James is that, you know, he decided, hey, this is something that I want to do. And this is going to be difficult because I have a 
job, I have a wife, I have a kid, and yet I'm going to take the time, I'm gonna carve it out and go to night classes to get this degree. And so when we do that, when we say, I'm gonna make this happen, what happens? Oh God, the yard still needs mowing. Uh, I still gotta go over here, there's a shutter that's loose. Oh, and my car's acting up. Oh yeah, I gotta take Nora over here. Oh yeah, it, you know? Those are all things that, you know, I still have those responsibilities. And for him to put forth the effort and the time and the energy and to be committed to it and to graduate, I think that's fantastic. And so uh, congratulations to you both and may God bless you both. Do not leave. I want to pray for you. Yeah. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for these two. And I ask your anointing on them. I ask your blessing on them. Thank you for all that they've accomplished. And I pray that they would accomplish even more for you, Lord. I, I know that you're leading them both. And I ask, Lord, that you would train and equip them with everything that they need, that you'd pour into them the Holy Spirit, and that you would use them to uh, change our community and to change our country and world. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.
the Caldwell's work. <laughs> I actually volunteered to sing with them, and they said I could sit on the front row and hum a little bit if I wanted to. <laughs> Thank you, later. <laughs> exactly right. We are going to be in the book of Exodus today, and uh, we'll start in, in chapter 3 of Exodus. We're building off of, it's part 2 of what we talked about last week, and uh, if you would, once you get turned there, if you will bow your heads with me, let's we'll say a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day, and we ask that you would lead this service. We ask that the words that are spoken would be in line with your will, and that they would produce a harvest within us, Lord. Um, Help us to focus, help us to be able to hear your words and let them uh, be ammunition for us. Let them be uh, nutrients and minerals that help us to grow and to be effective for you out in the world. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys know, can't preach in a coat. And uh, we're going to be talking about Moses and we need to start and work our way backwards. What I mean by that is, is we have to get to the point where we look at Moses standing with the children of Israel, millions of people, by the way, and he's standing at the Red Sea. And every one of you all have Charlton Heston in your head right now. I know you do. But the staff above his head, right, the Ten Commandments that we talked about in the movie, that's what I was talking about. But he's got that staff up above his head, and what does the Red Sea do? It parts. Let's remember this. It's not Moses that's parting it. It's not because he's holding that stick in some way, shape, or form. But it parts because God has it part. And they walk across on dry land, all of them, all of them. They get to the other side. The Egyptians follow them in. And the water crashes back across their enemies. And they are rescued. Does everybody agree with me and shake your head yes that I remember that story? I know what you're talking about. Many of us long to be that kind of Bible character. We long to be that kind of person walking the earth, that we have that kind of God that we serve working through us, and we see those kinds of miracles, that we see effectiveness and fruitfulness in our walk with Christ. We, we're working our way backwards because we need to see who was he in the beginning? Who was Moses standing at the burning bush out in Midian? At the, at the, I mean, he, he goes out, he's a shepherd at that time, and he is actually at the mountain of God, and he's standing there watching a bunch of sheep. He's a nobody, and in fact, he's a nobody who thinks of himself as a nobody. Many of us, that's us sitting here today, we think of ourselves as, boy, I've not done much with my life, right? right? Maybe I haven't accomplished a whole lot for God. Maybe, right? And Moses thought those things. And in fact, when God calls him, he says things like, how can you use me? We've said those words, right? Is that, so if we're working our way backwards. He was at the Red Sea. He's standing there with a staff above his head. But before that, he actually put his faith into practice with 10 plagues, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? That he went and stood before the world's number one leader, Pharaoh. He stood there in his face and he said, let my people go. That's what God says. And Pharaoh says no. And at each moment, what does Moses do? This is what's going to happen. Do you know what kind of faith it takes to do that? Can you imagine standing there and you're talking to Obama or Biden or Trump? You're talking to uh, George W. You're talking to Putin. You're talking to whoever, right? And you're standing there in with all of their cabinet full of people, their, their staff. And you're going, you need to do this. God says do this. And the next words that come out of your mouth is, are, if you don't, then this is what's going to happen. The first of which is the Nile is going to turn to blood. Then you're going to have gnats and frogs and flies. Then you're going to have right and this whole list. But each time he has to come before Pharaoh and say, here comes the next one. And then wait on what? What's he waiting on? What's Moses waiting on? Can Moses, does Moses have something that makes flies and gnats and frogs? Does he have a machine that he just flips a switch on? What does he have to wait on? God to do it, right? He has to wait on God to do it. And what if it took 10 minutes? God's going to do it. Don't you worry. What if it was a day and a half? 
<clears throat> I announced it, Lord told them that it was coming. Um, it's been a day and a half at this point. Uh, Lord, you're, you're, Lord, right? We have to wait on God and his timing to do whatever it is, right? And God was faithful. God did it. But that's, right? He was using that to do big, giant miracles. Ten of them in a row, right? I mean, these massive, massive things. Things like, okay, can you imagine, and we know where it comes from, but that you're standing there and you go, Pharaoh, God says to do this and to prove that, here's my staff. He throws it on the ground. And Pharaoh goes, lovely stick that you just threw on my ground there, um, right? Moses had to believe what? That God was going to be faithful and do what he told him, which was he's going to turn that stick into a snake in front of Pharaoh. And he does. Those are huge miracles. Those, if you're sitting in a church service and I come in and I say, I got a word from the Lord for you. Watch this. And I throw that stick down and it turns into a snake. Half of you get up and run as fast as you can. Right? Oh, preacher's got a snake handling, right? I mean, that, you, you know what I'm saying is that you would, that's, that's beyond my reason. That's beyond my logic that that's happening. But you know, he also, if we back up another step, he did it on a smaller scale too. Stepped out in faith because God said, I want you to go and go to the elders, the leaders of the Israelites, and I want you to do those same miracles for them first. I want you to throw the staff on the ground and it's going to turn into a snake. I want you to pour water out and it's going to turn to blood. I want you to put your hand inside your cloak and take it out and it'll be leprous. And when you put it back in, he comes back out healed. <coughs> I want you to do those things in front of them. And that's a smaller group of people, right? That's people of his own. Those are Israelites. People like him that he's doing it in front of. Well, let's be honest. Is, isn't that a little easier than doing it in front of Pharaoh? If I said, God wants you to do something and he wants to do it at your house, you would go, oh, huh, okay, I can do that. If I said, God wants you to do something, he wants you to do it at the White House, you'd be going, <laughs> right? It changes things in terms of the level of my belief, a level of my faith, how willing I am to physically say, yes, sir, here I am. But let's take it all the way back to the first step. Moses is living out in the wilderness in Midian. Why? Why is he there? He had killed a man. In, he had killed someone in, in Egypt. But he, let's, let's be honest about it. He was defending somebody that was getting beaten, one of his own people. And so... You have this guy, and I want you to kind of consider his heart, because you're going to try to try to figure out why did God choose him. And God is sovereign. He can do exactly what he wants to do. Let's make sure that we understand that. It's not, nobody here is sitting here so good and so worthy and so righteous that God's going to go, yeah, I'm going to use them. He chooses who he's going to use because he knows how it's all going to work out. He does it to bless you. He uses you to bless somebody else. And so Moses, on two different occasions... Now, we tend to go, he lived a charmed life. His mother put him in a basket in a river full of crocodiles and he survived, right? Got to live in, in Pharaoh's house and be raised by Pharaoh's daughter. All those things. But he's standing in there and there's a, there's a fight going on. Egyptian versus Israelite. And he's willing to get involved. Do you see that? Many of us see things all the time. We drive down the road here. Who here stops if a car is on fire? Who stops to help? Okay, but, I mean, we're just, I'm just trying to help you find yourself here. You know what I mean? Connor had a flat tire this week, and it was on Theta Pi. <clears throat> and so his car is physically sitting on Theta Pi. And there are cars going. <laughs> right? And we're trying to get the, the, you know, the jack under. There's a man there, a, a guardian angel who stops to help Connor, opens the trunk of his car, and pulls out one of those jacks, a floor jack, out of the back of his car. Lifted up the car. I went, who are you? You, you, you? you walk around with that? You got that in your car? And he's got all these tools. And he changes his tire in about five minutes on Theta Pi. With cars going like this. No one else stopping to help because somebody was already there. So here we are. Moses sees a fight going on and he intervenes. Do you see that? When he goes, when he runs away because <clears throat> Pharaoh decides that he's wanting to kill him. <clears throat> I apologize. I got tickled my throat. When he goes to Midian, the first thing he meets are some women. And the women are, uh, you know, they're there getting water. And some shepherds come in and start harassing them. It doesn't say whether it's like, hey, babe, want to go get a drink? It doesn't say any of those things. It just says they were harassing them in some way, shape, or form. 
Moses sees that, and what does he do? Gets in the middle of it. He intervenes. That tells you something about his character and something about his heart, doesn't it? In terms of his willingness to be a part of something or to stand up for something. So in chapter 3 of Exodus, I want you to read with me here. And it says, <clears throat> Now Moses, this verse 1, was tending the flock, <coughs> pardon me, tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that through the bush was on, though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. Let's be honest. Part of us would run. See something that's out of the ordinary, outside my logic, something supernatural, we run. We, we're out of fear. We're, we, we're not going to go over and check it out. He goes to check it out. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. If I walk over to a bush that's on fire, Jimmy, and, and there's a voice coming out of that bush, I ain't talking back. <laughs> I'm not talking back. I'm not. I'm, I'm running. I'm not. The, that's a bush that's talking to me because I know that Connor Cook and his friends have hooked up some apparatus that they're trying to trick me and put me on the internet, right? That, that, that a dog. I go to his house and his dog's talking to me. I will know there's something going on, right? Back then, he's hearing this. He's out in the middle of nowhere, and yet he responds. And he responds, "It's you, Lord." He knows the voice. That means he had a relationship with him. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. That's actually an act of humility. That's kind of like the coronation yesterday when everybody's bowing to the new king. He's actually giving him the glory that he did and the honor he deserves. The Lord, because you're not supposed to look upon God. That's his, his thought. The Lord said, I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard from uh, them crying out because of their slave drivers. We read this and it's black and white letters on a page, right? Moses is standing out in the middle of nowhere. He was somebody in Egypt. He had status. He had money. He had education. He had opportunities. And because of his actions, now he's ended up watching a bunch of filthy, dumb sheep out in the middle of nowhere. His life is miserable, is it not? And what is God talking about when he speaks to him? I've seen your misery, Moses, and I've come to help. No, 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 no. What does it say? What are the words? I have heard my people crying out, and I have come to you because we're going to do something about it. Not something about yours. He said, I need you to go help them, and by doing that, you're going to be blessed. Do you get that? Do you see that? Because it's not, Moses, I, I, I think you're somebody righteous. I think you're somebody great. I think you're somebody really good. So I'm going to come and do this for you. He says, I need you to go here. He doesn't need him to. He wants him to so that he finds his purpose, that he becomes fruitful on the earth. And if, if we keep reading, uh, let's jump down a little bit to verse, uh, I guess it's verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? That tends to be us. Um, if, if we start looking at the story, um, I want us to try to fathom some of this. I want us to try to see God wants you to go. He's calling you. You're not Moses. You are Jason or you're Patsy or you're Tina, right? You're John or Abby. You're, you're somebody that God has a plan for. Every single person sitting here and every single person watching, God has a purpose for you here on earth. And it may not be a singularity of purpose. It may just be my right now purpose. You understand what I mean by that? He called, he's calling all of us to ministry out in the world somewhere. It may be a ministry to your mother. Maybe a ministry to your brothers and sisters. Might be a ministry to the neighbor on this side of your house. It might be a ministry to women in the United States. It could be a ministry to a certain people group in Africa. I don't know what that is. I just know that God has a place and a ministry for you. And we're sitting here and the idea is Moses starting to say things about himself. Making excuses I can't do this. I'm not worthy. Who am I? Those kind of things. And yet, if he doesn't go, who suffers? 
he suffers, but the people that you are going to minister to suffer. Do, do you understand that? The reason that we go, the why. Okay, so I believe <clears throat> that God has a reason, and it's a bunch of reasons. He has the ability to think of things on so many different levels than, than I do. I think very linearly uh, with just what's in front of me. He sees all the depth and all the width of everything and the breadth of it. And so we were in Knoxville working at a church and a girl that was in our youth group uh, decided that it would be a good idea. Some girls in the bathroom had said, hey, smoke some of this. It'll make you feel really good. And it was a joint, right? It was marijuana. That's what she thought. So she, in the middle of a class, she had a bathroom pass, right? She, she was just going to use the restroom and wash her hands. And these friends of hers, people who had influence over her, people that she looked up to, people that she's grown up with and known, said, this is a good idea. And so she did. Unfortunately, it was laced with something that threw her into, she passed out onto the floor and she had a seizure. And at that moment, she was a different person from that point on. Completely different. Am I lying about that, Jill? We went on a mission trip, and she went with us on this mission trip. Still involved in church. Still, we can see a, de a definite change in her. We get to Texas, and she takes quite a bit of medication for some of the mental illness kind of stuff that was now afflicting her to help the symptoms of what she had now because she had taken these drugs. The mother thought... That medication, I don't want my daughter to be on that medication. That, that's, there's some stigma to that. So while they're gone for 10 days to Texas, I'm not going to give her that medicine. I'll just keep it back, and she, she'll wean off of it while she's with the youth group and with the, us as chaperones. We get to Texas, and this girl is out of her mind. Out of her mind. I am a rational, normal person. I have lots of patience with teenagers. You can ask my wife. I'm as laid back as they come because I want you to know Jesus Christ. I want you to know how great he is. But this girl was so bad that at one point, Jill had to put her in a room while we talked to her mother on the phone. And she was throwing stuff and we had to hold the door closed. A room with windows and all of that. But we're holding it because she is flat out throwing stuff at this point. And so the mom goes, oh, I will FedEx you some medicine. And we go, I don't know that that's good enough. I don't know what we're supposed to do. And so I opened the door and I started talking to her and I said, this is what's got to happen. Your mom is sending your medicine. It'll be here first thing in the morning. Can we get along till then and, you know, calm it down and all that. And when she took the medicine, then she was back to some form of normal, which was. All because of that one decision. So the reason that I go places and the reason that I do ministry and the reason that I'm obedient to God is for most and for children and for youth and for adults who are standing at that pre precipice and they're trying to weigh, should I do this or should I not do this? Right? That's the reason I do ministry because I hope to be the angel on this shoulder saying, this wouldn't be a good idea. I would suggest not doing this. Not because of what I think, because of what the Bible says and because of what it'll bring into your life. Though, you know, Try to breathe some wisdom and knowledge from the Bible into their lives. So we had another youth. Uh, at another church that was uh, sitting there one night and she had a friend over to spend the night and she said uh, she goes I'm so glad that you're over here tonight or whatever and the phone rings and she answers it about I don't know 10 o'clock at night and it's some boys on the phone and they're like boys are on the phone you know you know that kind of thing and uh, the boys said hey um, why don't you guys sneak out and meet us outside about let's say about midnight and we'll pick you all up and we'll go down to the lake and we'll get some beer and we'll just hang out. And so the girl who's spending the night, the friend, says, no way, not doing it, not going. And the girl who's in our youth group, who says, oh, you only live once. You can't just stay, you know, you, you have to take a risk. You have to take a chance. You have to live life to the fullest. We don't know how long we're going to be here. We should go. It'll be fun. Who's going to get hurt? It's you know, country Tennessee, there's nothing to be afraid of. And the girl goes, if you think so, I hate doing this, but yeah, I'll go. So she goes and they go down and they go down to the lake. They grab some beer at a local convenience store using a fake ID. They go down, sit and drink for a while. And then they decide that they're going to take them back home. And it's about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. Nobody's the wiser. They're going down the road. The guy who's driving the car has had too much to drink, gets off, hits a telephone pole. 
the girl that is the friend uh, hits the telephone pole, loses use of her left arm completely, has all kinds of abrasions and has to have skin grafts and all of these kind of things. The girl who, in, who said, yes, it's a good idea to go out, ends up having the skin ripped off her back back here and ends up having to have a skin graft done on that and has all these surgeries done on it to, to solve this. No one dies in the whole situation, but the friend loses the use of her left arm. And I can remember sitting in youth group meetings where that one girl did nothing but just cry. The one that had said, yeah, it's a good idea, we should go out. And it just changed her from that point on, right? It, it took a girl who was bright and brilliant, a girl with possibilities and opportunities, and turned her into a situation to where she was broken. Broken in a good way, but also in a bad way. She, had, she turned to God in the midst of all of that. But all the baggage and garbage that she drug around for the next 5, 10, 15 years of what had happened and what she had done to her friend, she had to carry that around. And so when God says, I need you to go do a ministry, it's for situations like that. It's for when people are suffering and God is sitting here and he says, my people are suffering. I need to do something here and I'm going to make you a part of it. And he says, I will be with you in, in verse uh, 12. And God said, I'll be with you and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? And he, he tells him who, who he is and all that. Let's skip down to 4.1. It says, Moses answered, what if they do not believe me and listen to me and say the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, and he gives him those three miracles, right? He says, the snake, the staff's going to turn into a snake. The cloak, you're going to put your hand in and turn leprous, put it back in, take it out. It's going to be healed. And then pouring water on the ground and it'll turn to blood. And then you have in verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? What makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. That's what we do a lot of times, right? Is we're like, Lord, please don't make me do this. Please, I, I don't, or I'm not sure that's the Lord talking. I'm not sure, right? And we step back from ministry because of the fear that is within us. The, we limit ourselves. That voice within our head is going, you're not good enough. You don't have enough skills. You're going to mess things up. You're going to lead people further away from the Lord than closer, right? We, we do all of those things. And so if we keep looking, he, he returns to Egypt. And I want you to look with me in 521. Uh, uh, look at 521. And actually, I'll start the paragraph at 19. 519. So Moses does all these things. He goes to Pharaoh. He, he actually answers the call to ministry. He goes to Pharaoh. He says, let my people go is what God is saying. He does the three signs. So that's the steps of faith. Not only in front of the Israelites, but in front of the Egyptians, in front of Pharaoh, the the, the leader of the whole known universe. And it says, when Pharaoh says, <clears throat> no, you, I'm not letting the people go. And in fact, I want you to make bricks without straw. I'm going to make your life harder for the Israelites. And so the slave masters come even harder, oppress them more. Things get worse initially. Initially, Do you see that? And then look at these words right here, because these are his own people. These are Moses' people. It says, the Israelite overseers realized they were in trouble when they were told you were not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, may the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Do they seem appreciative? So he steps out in faith, does all these things. And in that moment, things don't change. Sometimes we go out in ministry and we think just because we showed up, just because we said and did exactly what God said, that things are going to change immediately. If you're dealing with situations where people are in poverty, people are addicted, people are in violent situations or in jail, is their situation going to change like that? Maybe, maybe not. You know what I'm saying? And so for us, we have to realize the patience aspect of it. What is it in Isaiah? Isaiah 40? 
We, we have it on t-shirts and bumper stickers. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, rise up on wings like eagles, walk and not grow weary, uh, uh, run and not grow weary, walk and not faint. Right? They that wait upon the Lord. So in our ministry, the ministry is long term. It's not necessarily short term. And for us, sometimes we go out in ministry and it's so bad initially that we turn and we go, oh, I got to get away from that. No way I'm going to keep doing that. And yet you're trying, you're taking hold of the gates of hell and you're shaking them by doing this ministry. What do you think is going to happen? Do you understand that? If somebody's addicted and you say, I want to help you. And you say, come live at my house for a while while we get you off drugs. What's that initial getting off drugs like? <laughs> you don't want that. You know what I'm saying? I mean, in terms of that initial, right? There, there, we have places where people go to detox for a reason. People are in lockdown because of a reason. The, the ministry itself can be very difficult, but we have to have that patience that comes with it. There's one last thing that I want to make sure that you see. Where is Moses when he's called? What's his situation? He's by himself out in the wilderness, alone. Where is he when he does the ministry? With Aaron, because Aaron's now his mouthpiece, right? He's the priest. He's with Aaron. He's with the Israelites. He's with, right? His ministry is in a group situation. God gives us our, when we have a quiet time, when we're alone, he speaks to us and he says things. And I've told you this before, is that when you say, Lord, speak to me, he will speak. He doesn't always say things like, you're awesome. He does. He says those things. But most of the time, what I found God says is, go here, do this. I want you in this person's life. Go over here, do this, do this. Go over here, meet this person, be a part of this. And we go from being alone to being together. We're doing ministry together. We do church together. Because he says, where two or more come together, there I am also. He doesn't say we're one or more is by himself. There I am also. He doesn't say that. But he does make sure for us that we're supposed to do this together. Why did Jesus have 12 disciples? What was the point? Why not just have one disciple? One of them will he let him find somebody. And let the next guy find somebody. And the next guy. Why have 12? There's something about when we come together. That when we learn in a group. When we minister in a group. That is, changes things. And so, for us, when we sit here and we look at these stories, we, we, we go, why go? You know, why, why, do you, why should I do this ministry? What's the point of doing this ministry? There's a guy. His church decided that they were going to reach people in bars. Can you imagine being a part of a committee meeting where they said, Larry, I've got an idea. I think we should go and minister in bars. We should go hang out in bars. Can you imagine what the response to that would have been? Jesus went and had dinner with some sinners and tax collectors and how that worked out for him, right? Somebody suggested we're going to go minister in bars. So this guy goes, yes, sir, I will go. Goes and sits in a bar. He's there and he crossed the room. He does this for several weeks. He's trying to have a conversation with people, trying to talk to people, trying to go where they are, the people who need help. And so he looks across the room and he sees a guy. He goes, I know that guy. Where do I know him from? And he and this guy had gone to school together as elementary school kids. And so he's sitting here and that guy gets up and comes across the room to talk to him. And he's like, uh, okay. He goes, hey, you're Joe, right? And he goes, yeah. And he said, I'm so-and-so. And he goes, oh. And so they hang out together in the bar. And he finds out that his friend is a drinking champion. He is the life of the party at this bar. He's the kind of the king of the bar. And so every night he out drinks everybody. They're all laying on the floor passed out. And he's going, sets it down and walks out. His life's in shambles. He steals from all of his friends, from the people around him. He lies to his parents all the time. He cheats in school to get by. His life is in misery. He's got no women who care about him at all in terms of a girlfriend. His life is in shambles. The guy who's in the bar to minister starts investing in his life, hanging out with him in the bar, not drinking, but being a part of his life. And one night after a big drinking session and after he's, you know, because when people drink, they do this. When somebody gets completely just smashed, my dad's absolutely alcoholic. I've spent so much time with alcoholics, it's unbelievable. 
And so you get the, I love you, man. I love you so much. You are so good. And then it goes to, my life is horrible and this is going on. I got this and this and this and this. And it was one of those nights. And he's sitting there and the friend is sitting there and he goes, you want to go to a meeting with me? Not that kind of meeting. It was a church meeting. It wasn't a 12-step program. He said, they're meeting at somebody's house this tomorrow night. And he, get, he was at this point where, and his friend, drinking champion of the whole town, goes, what is it? He said, just some people getting together. It's like a Bible study kind of thing. And the guy goes, no, I don't think so. I don't want a God. That's okay. I don't want God. Keeps asking him over a course of weeks, maybe a month. And finally, the guy goes, yeah, I'll go with you. You always ask me. I'll go with you. And he goes and he sits down, sits in a chair, and he's listening to what the guy has to say. And he's going, yeah, 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 yeah. But he looks across, and there's this beautiful woman sitting in a chair across from him. And he goes, note to self, come back here again. Right? Comes back because that woman's there. But in coming back week after week, he's doing what? Hearing what the guy is talking about. Hearing the Bible study, and in turn, gives his life to Christ. Do you know who this rotten scoundrel was? William Carey. No, no, that's not right. I'm sorry, that's not William Carey. It is uh, George Mueller. I apologize, that just, that just came into my head. George Mueller. George Mueller that ran an orphanage for 2,000 kids and was a great, mighty uh, man for God the rest of his life. But it took a guy going and sitting on a bar stool in a bar so out of place and so un extraordinary, willingness to go there to sit and invest in his life. And because he did that, William Carey got out of that situation. I said William Carey again. George Mueller got out of that situation. His, his relationship with his father improved. He did much better in school, got great grades without cheating, married the girl that uh, was across the room, and lived his life uh, for other people and for God. All because of the dedication and the willingness of that man to do ministry. That's where we sit today. There are people who are longing to have us in their lives. And when we get involved in their lives initially, you're going to find that pain and suffering. You're going to find that, that it's, oh my goodness, this I'm not helping, I'm hurting, I'm throwing gas on a fire. And yet in the midst of that, if we overcome and we're patient, God does great mighty things. Like what? What happens in this story? Over a million people who are enslaved in a furnace working with making bricks without straw are rescued because Moses is willing to go out there and hold that up above his head and watch the water part and trust God so much that he was able to do those kinds of things in his life. He had that kind of faith because God had grown it within him one step at a time, much like these that I explained to the children. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much uh, that you're at work in our lives, that you're molding and shaping us, that you are trying to use us in so many different ways, not only in Murray County, but in all across the land and in this world. I pray, Lord, that you would give us great vision. You know, if it takes you speaking to us out of a burning bush, I pray that you would do that. If it's speaking through your word or speaking through a mentor or speaking through another Christian, do that, Lord. Whatever it takes, if it's a, an audible voice or if it's that still small voice within us, let us know without a doubt that it's you calling and you, your message to us is clear that we know what to do. And Lord, I pray that you would give us the faith to do it, to help us to step out. And Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, sorry to say you guys were coming up here and you're already up here. So... Uh, as we stand and sing together, I'm going to ask you, if you feel led by the Lord, to come and to pray and uh, to come and uh, whatever God lays on your heart. Maybe you want to join the church. Maybe you want to become a Christian. Whatever it might be, as we stand and sing together our concluding song, which is How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Will you come? <clears throat>
take a seat. Sam, there was a smattering of applause back there. <laughs> Let me tell you how important this is. This young woman that I met um, was, she came into church one Sunday. And she sat down and she said, you know, enjoyed the service and all of that. And she said, I'm married to somebody I think you know. And she shared that with me. And, and it was a guy I'd gone to high school with. And he and I had dated sisters. And so I, I saw him a lot in high school. I was over at her house and he would be there to, to visit the sister. And so um, she said, Will you pray for him? And I said, well, sure. I said, what's going on? And she shared with me that he had some addiction issues and he had been let go from his job and he had a broken marriage and this was his second marriage. And she had married him knowing he had lots of baggage. And she said, but would you, would you pray for him with me? And over the course of the next year, she was in church and she was uh, involved with kids and she was involved with youth. And uh, she kept inviting him to come and we kind of reconnected, he and I. And so he would come to a Bible study, and then he would show up for church, and then he got to where he was, he, he recommitted his life to Christ. And I was blown away by her commitment to him to walk that path with him because it was a struggle. And in the midst of that, his parents lived very nearby, and his mom was from Japan, had come over during World War, uh, after World War II, did not speak any English, and she had married a serviceman. And his dad, who I knew in high school, was awful, rotten, terrible man. We hated to go over to his house because we'd be like, oh, God, his dad is so mean. That's the meanest man I've ever met in my life. You know, and he was just very, very, very hard to get along with. This woman that, that came to the church, she started investing in his parents. And so she would go with his mother to places. She would invite her everywhere. She befriended her. She would go over and cook with her and ask her to teach her things. And, and they became fast friends. And over the course of the next four, five years, the woman came to know the Lord and gave her life to Christ. I did her funeral when she passed away and was able to say the words that she knew Jesus. She had been Shintoist her whole life up to that point. Because of this young woman, she got invested in the dad's life. And I said, about that, that man, he, he's as hard as granite, right? And so uh, over the course of the next four or five years, she invested in his life, cared for him, brought him food, ministered to him, listened to him. And over the course of that time, he came to know the Lord and gave his life. And I saw him transform into a completely different person completely different person. He would walk into church and his grandkids would run up and jump into his arms and he would just hug and squeeze on them. And I did his funeral when he passed away. And I got to say the words that he knew the Lord as Jesus as his Savior. In the two weeks before I did his funeral, I asked my friend, I said, the guy, I said, you got to tell me, why was your dad so mean for all those years? And I shared this with some of you. His dad had been in Vietnam and had been taken captive, was a POW, for about three to four years during Vietnam. He was held in a cage. <coughs> Uh, that hung from a tree. I know that seems like a movie problem, but that's exactly what happened. Our bombers went through wherever he was being held, bombed the area, the tree fell over, his happened to hit the ground and break open. He got out, released a bunch of the other prisoners who were also hanging in those cages. One guy, because of the atrophy of his muscles, could not run or walk to get himself out of there, and he put him over his shoulder and went into the fire, much like Forrest Gump, right? Into it, because he had to get back to his side, and they're shooting this way, and we were shooting at, at the end. And so that was the life he had led, and he had been tortured for over three years. And in the midst of that, he had kind of shook his fist at God and said, how could you have let this happen, right? And because of this young woman's ministry. Now you, you know that I didn't say she had a name for it, right? There, there, was no, there was no organized ministry. She just ministered to her husband. She ministered to her mother-in-law. She ministered to her father-in-law. And all of them are were fully functioning Christians, two of which have passed on in their heaven awaiting them. And I'm blown away whenever I meet her because I go, you're, you're a great woman of God. And she's like, me? Who am I? And I'm like, God uses you to do mighty miracles in this world and people's lives are transformed. That's what we long for. Okay, so the actual, instead of doing a concluding uh, 
prayer. I'm going to do a benediction that comes from the book of Numbers. And this is for our graduates, but it's also for you all as well. It's number 6, uh, 24. And this is um, the oldest piece of scripture that we know that exists is this passage. Um, oldest Hebrew piece of scripture that we have. So it's Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. I'm losing the sword on my, my way. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and to keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you all. Have a great week.